My name is Victor Furman. Some call me The Voice. I've always been fascinated with human nature, spirituality, science, and the crossroads at which they meet. Join me now and we will explore these topics and so much more with fascinating guests, authors, and experts who will guide us to Destination Unlimited. Premonitions of death, near-death experiences, and afterlife communication are common experiences, but they may be difficult for some to discuss and understand. With the amplified loss of life from the COVID-19 pandemic and grieving often exacerbated by physical separation, it is comforting to understand and embrace the experiences of others and know what's possible at life's end. My guest this week on Destination Unlimited, Dr. Kenneth Doka, is a world-renowned expert on death, dying, and bereavement, and has explored dozens of case studies and fascinating research on the unusual phenomenon related to the dying process and helps us come to an understanding of what these experiences mean. Dr. Doka has edited or written more than 35 acclaimed books on death-related subjects, including Grief is a Journey. He's a senior consultant for the Hospice Foundation of America, former president of the Association for Death Education and Counseling, and former director of the International Work Group on Death, Dying, and Bereavement. His website is drkendoka.com, and he joins me this week to discuss his work and his latest book, When We Die, Extraordinary Experiences at Life's End. Please join me in welcoming to Destination Unlimited, Dr. Ken Doka. Welcome, Ken. Thank you very much. I'm honored to be on the show. And thank you for joining us today at this important time to share your wisdom and your experience with our listeners. So please share with our listeners your path and what drew you to the field of death, dying, and grief. Well, it, it, uh, we of, I often joke about that with my son who says, when you were 10 years old and, and people said to you, what do you want to uh, be when you grew up, Kenny? Did you say a, a thanatologist? And, and of course, the answer was no. <laughs> um, what happened was that I was actually, when I started graduate school, I was actually interested in delinquency. Um, and I was uh, juggling two schools at the same time. Uh, I was going for a graduate degree in sociology. And I was studying at uh, St. Louis Seminary, Concordia Seminary in St. Louis the Lutheran ministry. And um, what happened was that I had to do an, an internship, a clinical experience. And, um, you know, you're not paid for that, you, but you have to do it. And, um, and I ended up deciding to do it at Spofford Center, which is where New York City holds its juvenile delinquents. This way, I could save some money by living at home rather than in St. Louis. And it was really, for me, the perfect uh, clinical experience. About a week before I left there, I got uh, left to go there. I got a letter from the director who said, um, guess what? I'm no longer at Spofford. I'm now at um, at the East Midtown Protestant Chaplaincy. And you can be um, you can join me there for your clinical experience or you can be released from your obligation. And at that point in time, um, it didn't make any sense to be released from my obligation um, because, you know, I just had so so short a time uh, to find a new a new program. So I I just sort of grinned and buried it and and thought, well, at least I, I'll be working with adults. When I got to Sloan Kettering, given my experience, um, they put me in the in the pediatric and adolescent wards. So I was working with with dying children and adolescents, um, most of whom had various forms of cancer. Um, and that really got me interested in the field, and that was where I sort of changed gears. Um, so as I said, it um, it wasn't something I expected to do. And when did the change come from you of approaching this from the clinical and pastoral sense to this other spiritual experience? Well, uh, as I say in the book, in, in When We Die... Um, a fairly mainstream Lutheran, I think, in terms of my theology. And and as a sociologist, um, I like to think of myself as, as a scientist, a social scientist. Um, but as you work in this field, and I've been in this field for really 50 years now at this point in time, you begin to encounter a whole series of experiences um, that people have. Um, you know, uh, dreams of the deceased, premonitions, um, all 
kinds of experiences, which are very, very common and happen all the time. And what I wanted to do was to write a what I considered to be a fair book on it, to say, look, it, you know, these are the kinds of experiences that people have reported. Um, these are the kinds of explanations that they, they've given for these kinds of experiences, um, but allow people to essentially set their own minds. I, I've, I always felt that a lot of the literature in the field was, were either um, strongly uh, p- people who strongly adhered to, believed in these experiences, or people who were out to debunk them. And I thought, well, we, we've got to acknowledge that these experiences have been reported from really from the beginning of history, uh, to now and almost in all cultures, at least all cultures that I know of. So I think we have to take them seriously. From my personal experience and from working with the bereaved in my capacity as an interfaith minister, I've come to understand that grieving is a very personal and individualized process. Your last book, Grief is a Journey, really examined that with both wisdom and compassion. Please tell us about your inspiration for Grief is a Journey. Oh, thank you very much uh, for that comment. Well, you know, one of the things, if you ask people, most people, most lay people, um, what they think about grief, they're often going to talk about the stages of grief. Oh, I guess I'm going through this, or how long will the anger stage last? And, and of course, that, that material, too, is really over um, over 50 years old. And, and there's been a lot more current stuff that's been written that really looks not so much at universal stages, really d- disallows universal stages, but at the very personal pathways that people use as they experience loss, um, that, it, that it really is deeply unique. And I wanted to write a book for people um, who, who are bereaved, um, not professionals. Most of my books are, are written for professionals, but for people who are struggling with grief, who are on the journey with grief, to really let them know um, that there's no set way to grieve, there's no single experience, and to help them examine their own ways of grieving and their own strengths to find how they want to manage their particular journey. Absolutely. I've had the experience of people going to extremes to work and keep themselves busy and occupied, to people who will sit in in depression and tears, uh, to people who will laugh. So there's no such thing as a standardized way of grieving. It's truly, truly an individual process. No right or no wrong. Whatever your sense of grief is, is what you have to process. So, Yeah, pr- although I would say there are certainly things that are, that, you know, show complications in grief. You know, and you mentioned some of them, long-lasting depressions and, um, you know, uh, people who become violent or self-destructive. Um, so certainly there are probably some... Um, some ways we we probably don't want to grieve, but beyond that, there's a wide range of what's what we might call uh, typical grieving. Absolutely. For our listeners who have recently lost a loved one, what words of comfort would you have for them? Well, first of all, I, I'd simply say I'm sorry, um, and I would say to them, um, you know, um, search your own beliefs, um, find in those what, what helps you, what comforts you. Look at the ways you've handled loss before. Um, what can you learn from that? What are the strengths you want to build on? What are the weaknesses you want to um, be careful of? Um, you know, uh, I, I asked that question once to a young college student who had just come back after, after his father's funeral. Um, and we started talking about how he handled loss before. And he, he said to me, you know, you were the last stop before Foley's. Uh, Foley's is, was the local college bar. Uh, and he said, um, maybe you're right. Maybe that's probably not going to be my next stop because, you know, he had used that in other losses. Um, and, you know, and, then, and he realized that was a self-destructive pattern. So it's it's really, you know, look at yourself. How does your faith, your beliefs, however you call your philosophy, however you define it, speak to you and speak to this loss? Um, and then examine your strengths and weaknesses and recognize that also, you know, among your strengths are the people in your support system. Um, and that can be very, very significant. One of the things I do with my clients is I, I ask them once I know they do have a support system to list it. And then I ask them to put a D next to all the people on that support system who are good doers. If you need something done, you need a ride, they'll do it. And then an L next to people who are good listeners. 
um, because that's important too, you know. And sometimes, um, sometimes there's one uh, you can ask your doers to listen, and they don't. You, you don't get heard, and you can ask your listeners to do, and nothing gets done. So it's helped helps to understand what your support system can offer you and who in your support system can offer you what things. And then I have another category I call respite people. These are the people you go out with that never talk about your loss and seem uncomfortable if you start bringing it up. But they have a role too because what they do is, I always say grief is hard work, probably some of the hardest work you can do. And you need people, uh, just like any hard work, you need time off. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, from personal family experience and those of others, uh, I know that the loss of a child is perhaps the most difficult. What would you say to bereaved parents? Well, I, I think to say it's, you know, it's certainly one of the hardest losses that you can deal with. It's very, very complicating. Um, I, you know, and, and again, beyond offering um, your empathy and, and your support, if it's a friend of yours, you know, recognize what you can offer them, what you can do for them. Um, what are your strengths in, in helping them? Um, avoid the bromides that people often use. Well, you know, at least you have three other children or um, you can get pregnant again, you know, because those are very unuseful and, and, and not helpful at all. Um, but simply simply be there to show support um, and acknowledge that this is painful. And, and I think another thing, too, if you're a friend – is to give people choices. You know, sometimes we isolate parents because we don't want to put them in painful situations. So maybe, um, you know, the, the child who, who died was my child's best friends and we often got together as families. Um, and, um, and, you know, and you're going to have a birthday party as you have had every year and, and you say, well, I won't invite them. Um, you know, it's better to just say, look, at, we're, we're having a party and, you're welcome to come, and if it's uncomfortable, we certainly understand that. But again, um, don't make decisions for people. For parents who are going through it, um, again, look to your strengths, look to your beliefs, what helps you. Look for your support. And as you say, the words, the bromides, are totally unhelpful, and perhaps the greatest gift we can give to them is the gift of sacred listening. Yeah, that's definitely, definitely. There's a, a wonderful little book by uh, Aaron Lynn, um, I'm probably out of print by now, just a thin little book you used to call Avoiding the Clichés of Grief. And what she would do is, and I sometimes teach that to people when I'm counseling them, because, you know, one of the things I, I always promise people is that in the course of your bereavement, I can't promise you how long it's going to last or what you're going to experience, but I know somebody's going to say something stupid in the midst of it. Yeah. And, and Aaron Lynn has a, has a neat way of looking at that. She asked three questions. I said, well, why, um, why did they say it? And most of the time, people aren't intentionally cruel. And so most of the time, you know, people say it because they, they want to say something. They, 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 they want to be helpful. And when we re realize that, that helps. And then the second question she asks is, why did it hurt? And it usually hurts because it invalidates our loss. It disenfranchises our loss. Um, sure, I'm, I might have three other kids, but I, I don't have another Laura or I don't have another Tommy. Um, and then the, um, the last thing she says is, you know, kind of an empowering statement. If that statement gets made and said again, what can you say? And, uh, and again, it may be as simple as saying, yes, um, the fact that I have three other kids is very comforting for me and, um, uh, and, and, and is helpful, but, I don't have that child anymore, and it's that child that I grieve and that child that I miss. Mm. Yeah. Grieving does not only apply to death, but also to relationships and marriages coming to an end, the loss of a job, and other circumstances referred to as disenfranchised grief. What is disenfranchised grief, and how does it differ from the grief of bereavement? Well, it, it doesn't differ in, in process. Um, you know, we have the same reactions, but what it refers to, and that's a book that I wrote really with my first book in 1989, where I, uh, and then a second follow up book to that in 2002. And what it really refers to are losses that aren't acknowledged by others. So we have a loss, but nobody understands or supports our grief. Um, originally, uh, came out of a study we did of ex spouses. And if your ex spouse dies, um, 
you know, usually don't get time off from work. But again, you may share children. You may have shared 20 years with that person. Um, you're still going to grieve that loss. Um, what was interesting is when we did that research, one of the things that fascinated me, and this was in the early 80s, is if you started looking at grief reactions for an ex-spouse, um, you, you didn't find anything. Um, but also, it, when, what, what was interesting is when we interviewed these ex-spouses, they would compare the grief of their divorce to the grief of subsequently losing their spouse, their ex-spouse. And if you looked in, in the indices in those days, you know, the, the equivalent of Google in the 80s, um, and look for divorce and grief, you would find nothing. But the people who were experiencing it acknowledged it as grief. You know, I always think it's interesting. I, I think we lost a lesson from Freud. In, uh, I always look at the beginning of this uh, study of thanatology, beginning a little bit over 100 years ago with Freud's article in 1919 on mourning and melancholia, where he's trying to distinguish grief and depression. And you know how Freud always started out with a case study, Victor? Yes. Do you know what his case study was for mourning and melancholia? No. It was a bride abandoned at the altar. Mm. And I think he was reminding us Grief is not about death. Grief is about loss. Is there a, are there different ways of processing the disenfranchised grief? Well, it, it, just like there are different ways of, of, of processing grief, and that's what I always stress. Disenfranchised grief is, in fact, grief. The only thing that's different is you're not getting the public support. There are no hallmark cards to send. Um, there's no recognition of that. And you're not getting the recognition from that you would normally do when you make that list of the people who were the helpful people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a little more difficult. What inspired your latest book, When We Die, Extraordinary Experiences at Life's End? Well, a number of years ago, uh, a colleague of mine, Terry Daniel, asked me to speak at what she calls an afterlife conference. And, um, and, you know, and, and, and it's an unusual conference in that, you know, it's people who, uh, you know, it, it has academic presenters on things like near-death experiences and, um, and, and all kinds of subjects like that, some of the subjects you mentioned earlier. Um, and, you know, and they commingle with mediums at this conference, you know, and, and other kinds of people. So when she first asked me, I kept saying, Terry, I don't think I'm your person here. I don't think this is... You know, I'm I'm not sure that you uh, you want me. Um, you know, I'm, um, and and so Terry, you know, and Terry insisted she did, and I thought, okay, well, let me give the presentation I'll give. And as I said, I tried to give a presentation saying these are the kinds of experiences that have been reported throughout history across cultures. Um, and I and I was very honest. I said they don't fit into my theology necessarily very very well. Um, they don't fit into my uh, scientific orientation, but we can't deny that people report these kinds of experiences. And, um, you know, and I didn't know how the audience would respond, but they responded. People came up to me later and said, you know, we really appreciate the way you address this, you know, with respect and with um, um, with appreciation and, you know, and. Uh, and, and just kind of laying out these different dimensions of the kinds of experiences that people had. So I thought it might be interesting to write a book on that, and it was. It was a fascinating uh, thing to research. Probably it was the book I enjoyed writing. Of all the books that I've written, I think I've enjoyed this one the most. And it goes to the point that no matter whether we agree or, or can understand or have common experience with someone else, when someone shares their experience and feelings, it's genuine to them. Oh, it, 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 and it's, it's, yeah, and as I said, you, you can't deny that people in great numbers have had many of the kinds of experiences reported in the books, you know, um, uh, reported in this book. Um, so, you know, we could differ on, on how we explain it or, you know, whether near-death experiences are, um, uh, you know, a result of, uh, you know, some kind of delusion or some kind of chemical reaction or, um, uh, you know, a real experience, but we can't deny the fact that people have reported these for eons. Absolutely. My guest, Dr. Kenneth Doka, he's the author of When We Die, Extraordinary Experiences at Life's End. Ken, please tell our listeners where they can find your book and find out more about you and your work. Sure. Um, 
my book, When We Die, Extraordinary Experiences of Life's End, as well as the Grief is a Journey, are both available through Amazon. But you can also um, get further information from my webpage, which is www.drkendoka.com. That's all one word, www.drkendoka.com. And we'll be back with more of Ken after these words on the OM Times Radio Network. The best of the holistic, spiritual, and conscious world. OM Times Radio. IOM FM. OM Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment. A philanthropic organization. Their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. OM Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Hello, I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, host of OM Times Magazine's flagship radio show, What is Going OM? My passion is sifting through information, research and innovations from new thought teachers, speakers and researchers pushing back the boundaries of what we know about life, energy, metaphysics and the universe. I love shifting perceptions about who we are, why we're here and how quickly impossible becomes normal when we open our minds, expand our awareness and accept that the only limits that exist are those we place upon ourselves. So if you're the kind of forward-thinking, eager investigator of what lies beyond the current reality that most perceive, why not make a date to come play with me in the field of possibilities at 4 p.m. Pacific Time, 7 p.m. Eastern Time every Thursday. And together, we can discover what's really going on. A social distancing tip. While the CDC urges you to avoid close contact, like hugging or shaking hands, there are other non-physical ways to say hello. Wave, wink, use sign language, salute, smile, give the peace sign, throw up an air high five, do jazz hands. Remember, stay a minimum of six feet or two arms length away from others and stay home if you can. For more info, visit coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Imagine yourself being transported to India to the banks of the Ganga and an ashram in Rishikesh. Visualize that you are welcome to satsang with an American sannyasi who shares the wisdom of her guru. Your visualization has manifested. Join Satvi Bhagawati Saraswati for inspiration and transformation every Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern on Om Times Radio. These are the sounds of a dinner. But not just any dinner. A dinner that almost didn't happen. Because without food, it can't. A dinner now served, thanks to people like you. Due to COVID-19, 17 million more Americans may face hunger. Feeding America is helping our neighbors in need. And if you're able, you can too. Donations to the COVID-19 Relief Fund are being accepted at feedingamerica.org slash coronavirus. Your help is needed now more than ever, and every dollar makes a difference. That's feedingamerica.org slash coronavirus. On behalf of Feeding America and families nationwide, thank you. Brought to you by the Ad Council and Feeding America, 200 Food Bank Strong. Grab a cup of tea or a glass of wine and tune in for Inspired Conversations with publisher Linda Joy on Tuesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern. Linda creates sacred space for leading female luminaries, empowering authors, heart-centered female entrepreneurs, coaches, and healers. A soulful venue where guests openly share the fears and obstacles they've overcome, wisdom and lessons learned, and the personal journey that led them to the transformational work they do in the world. Inspired conversations to empower you on your path to authentic, soulful living. Back on Destination Unlimited, my guest this week, Dr. Ken Doka. He's the author of When We Die, Extraordinary Experiences at Life's End. 
Ken, in When We Die, you share about those who have had premonitions of death. How unusual is this? And would you give us an example? Sure. Well, probably the most uh, prevalent example is reported by Lincoln's good friend and bodyguard, who uh, told the story of Lincoln prior to his assassination um, in a dream, had a dream where he woke up and, and he heard crying in the White House. And so he goes downstairs and he asks the soldier who's a, a guard there what's going on. And the man looks at him in his dream and says, don't you know, sir, the, the president has been shot. So that's probably the most famous premonition of, of, of death um, that, that someone has reported. Um, you know, fascinating, fascinating material on that. Did Lincoln have his own premonition, too, or something of that nature? Well, that, that was, no, that was Lincoln's premonition. Oh, that was Lincoln's premonition. Okay. Yeah, it was reported to his, the, he didn't report it, but subsequently his bodyguard and his best friend reported it. I understand. You also share that your, your own father had a premonition. Well, that's I wouldn't call it so much a, pre- a premonition as as what Callanan and Kelly, and that's a whole other chapter in the book called nearing death awareness, and that's when you know. So with someone, the premonition is when someone is is healthy, and all of a sudden they have a premonition of death. Uh, by the way, the second famous one, of course, is uh, Mark Twain, who said, "I came uh, I came with Halley's comet, and, uh, and I'll die with it." And sure enough, he, <laughs> he did. <laughs> Uh, that's what happened. Absolutely. Um, but, uh, but the nearing death awareness is a little bit different. This is when someone is clearly, um, clearly dying in the dying process and, and they communicate the nearness of death in one of maybe three or four ways. Uh, the most common would be, um, to say, uh, well, the, the three most common that McKellen and Kelly talk about are, you know, um, where they, they, talk about going on a trip. So you're thinking this guy's in, um, in, you know, he, he can't get out of bed. Um, we can't, he can't even get to the bathroom and he's talking about catching a train tomorrow. Um, or the second kind of experience is, is when they talk about seeing deceased relatives where they say something like, I was just talking to grandma yesterday and you're thinking grandma died 30 years ago. Um, and then the, the experience that my father had was, is uh, one of those three most common. And that's where um, – now, he, had, he was in hospice. He knew he was dying. Uh, but all of a sudden, one morning, he woke up and he said, am I dying? And he, didn't, he wasn't saying, do I have a terminal disease that's, that's going to kill me? He knew that. But he was saying – he was talking about the imminence of death, that he was actively dying. Uh, my mother called me up and said, you better get over here. I live about an hour and a half north of them. And, you know, I, I went down that day and I said, what's what's going on, Dad? And he said, I just feel different today. I said, are you in pain? No. Are you, you know, uncomfortable? No. Um, and then, you know, we, and so the whole family came over and we sat with him throughout the day. Uh, we reminisced. We held his hand. We, you know, we hugged him. And about 8 o'clock that night, he said, um, I, I'm feeling a little bit better now. Why don't you people all go to your rooms and, you know, because we were still in our, our, our old house and, um, and, and, you know, and, and, and just get some sleep. Uh, of course, he died that night. Uh, and my sister always felt bad that we didn't stay with him. But I think um, I honestly think that he needed us to be there that day, but he couldn't pass on without a, w- with us so physically present. Mm, absolutely. It's interesting that uh, my uh, uh, had an experience where my aunt, before uh, passing away, her uh, her grandchildren were at her bedside, and she said, uh, "She said I have to pack. I have to get ready." And they said, yeah, "What yeah. do you have to pack for?" She says, "The ship is about to leave, and I, I don't want to miss the cruise." So yeah. that that was an experience that she had and uh, told to uh, uh, her grandchildren. And uh, my grandmother, uh, before she passed, uh, my daughter, who was 12 or 13 at the time, was with her. Uh, and uh, my, my, my daughter, who was very sensitive, a little bit uh, on the psychic side, uh, that morning said, Dad, I don't want to go to school today. And she would never skip school for any reason. She said, I just have a feeling I should stay home today. Is that okay? And I said, of course, if you honor your feelings. And about three hours later, uh, she walked into uh, my grandmother's room, her great-grandmother's room, and she said, honey, Grandma said, honey, please give me a hug. Hold on to me for a minute. 
she says, I see Uncle Bob is coming and oh, wow. Grandpa Victor is coming. They're all coming for me. Give me a kiss and say goodbye. And, and she passed. And for my yeah. daughter, that was a wonderful experience because it showed her not to be afraid of yeah. death. And, and you know what's, what's been interesting is as, um, as I've written and spoken about this book, People have, you know, said, oh, wow, well, let me tell you about my experience. And, and again, for so many people, I think that's a liberating thing because I think a lot of people hold these things back because they say if I, if I talk about it with enough people, they're going to, you know, put me in a, in a uh, you know, for a mental evaluation when, in fact, these experiences are very, very common. So we talk about this near death, uh, nearing death awareness or NDA. Let's talk a little bit about NDE. What's your take on NDE? That's certainly they're there. And, you know, as, as to what they mean or, you know, uh, again, um, it's really not a book that judges, but but certainly people have had those experiences and, and they've had them throughout history. And um, and they're fascinating. The first time I ever heard of one I write about in the book um, where this, um, uh, you know, I used to lifeguard at one point in time much earlier in my life. And one of the places I always avoided lifeguarding in New York was Rockaway Beach because it's um, – <laughs> That's about 15 minutes from where I live. <laughs> oh, OK. Well, you know Rockaway. It's very I dangerous. Do. It's got all kinds of cross currents. You know, uh, I, preferred, I preferred lifeguarding in a pool where you know, I, I think in my entire life I did one rescue. <laughs> You know, and you know you're constantly working in Rockaway, um, or you know, or Jones Beach. That's right, you're in Jamaica, and um, and you know, in one of the stories, and the lifeguards all got a, you know, there was a network of lifeguards. We, you know, we um, we came from the we came from different swim clubs. We competed against each other in swim teams. You know, we basically knew a lot about each other. And there was a situation once, and first, and 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 nobody had even written about near death experiences, where this um, this lifeguard rescued this little little boy, and I forget the name of the lifeguard. Uh, it's in the book, but I just can't can't think of it now. So he, he rescues this little boy, uh, sees him go under, gets out, you know, brings him back. Kid's unconscious, starts doing, um, uh, you know, mouth to mouth, and most people think of that as you know, kind of very um, dramatic and heroic and they don't realize how messy and how hard it is you know people literally are regurgitating into your mouth it's not the most pleasant experience and so after doing this the lifeguard takes a break as somebody else picks up and um you know and and the kid comes to consciousness and i'm just going to make up this name now because I, I don't have time to look it up in the book and he says where's john and the the lifeguard immediately freezes thinking maybe there's another kid out there you know and he, and he said, were you, were you with a friend when you went under? He said, no, no, John, the blonde lifeguard. And then he talked about this experience. He was only about nine or ten years old. He talked about this experience where he, you know, he was um, – he saw himself going through this this tunnel, the, almost a very classic experience. And um, and and then saw his mom crying and, and you know, and, and a voice said, you have to go back to your mom. But he somehow – but he said he, he could see the rescue. You know, that that out of body experience. And he knew that this blonde lifeguard, John, had rescued him. And um, so, you know, they wanted to get him in an ambulance and he he wouldn't he didn't want to leave until he thanked John. Mm -hmm. um, so John came out of the shack, you know, lifeguard shack. And as soon as he started walking out, um, he the boy recognized him and said, that's him. That's him. You know, without even being introduced to him. And, you know, and I remember thinking about that. That was in the late 60s before any of the writings came out. And, you know, and it, it went all through the, the lifeguard community as we tried to make sense of that. And so the dear death experience, how frequently are they reported? Well, you know, I think of all the kinds of phenomena that that we know of, this is probably the area that has the most research and the most reports about it and the most people doing work on it. And, and you know, and, and some of it is fascinating because um, – Alan Kelleher, um, uh, I'm not sure if he's Australian originally or British, wonderful, wonderful person uh, and wonderful researcher. He's done a lot of research, as has Sushkin, on, um, on near-death experiences in other cultures, which are different. You know, people may see themselves not going through a tunnel, but on a, you know, um, in, in the South Pacific, in a lagoon, going toward a light, you know. Um, so it's interesting that they're clearly influenced by culture. But they frequently have some of the same elements, you know, this this kind of um, seeing something, feeling peaceful, and then being drawn back for some reason or another. Mm, yeah. 
My mom passed in January of 2020, and I officiated the funeral for our family. One of the things that I lovingly teased about during the eulogy was that my mom was a Coke fiend, and I quickly said, not the white powder, but the soda. <laughs> she, always, she always had cases of it in the house when we were kids, and when we left the funeral home, about 20 of us went out for a meal at a local restaurant. We all placed our beverage orders, and the server brought them to the table. Five minutes later, the server came back with a glass and said, who ordered the Coke? Now, we all looked at each other and started laughing, knowing this was mom's way of telling us that she was with us. In When We Die, you discuss these seeming coincidences. How frequent are they, and what have you discovered about them? Oh, well, um, yeah, I mean, they are they are fascinating, and, and again— um, you know, that's that's a good example. I don't know how common they are, but but they are, in fact, remarkable. Um, one of the things that that struck me about all these different kinds of coincidences, we talked about Lincoln before. Uh, do you remember in the book where I mentioned that Robert Todd Lincoln was present at the assassination of all three presidents uh, in the 19th century? I'm sorry. But, you know, he you know, he was um, as Lincoln's son. He was a pr- pr- um prominent business person later on and a prominent politician, um, served as ambassadors and stuff like that. Uh, so he was there when Garfield was assassinated. He was there when McKinley was assassinated. When uh, Teddy Roosevelt invited him to a White House function, he declined saying that um, that bad things happen when I'm around presidents. Mm. But uh, but one of the interesting things about him, if you talk about coincidences, and, and I mentioned that in the book, is when he was a young college student, um, he was pushed forward, um, possibly into danger, possibly into falling off a train platform to an incoming train as the crowd rushed toward this incoming train. And a hand reached out and grabbed him and pulled him back. And when he looked at the, at the person holding that hand or, or, or possessing that hand, he recognized him as a famous actor, Edwin Booth, John Wilkes Booth's brother. Brother. <laughs> Amazing. And, uh, and evidently later, uh, Edwin found out about the story and, um, you know, declared it to be of some comfort to him that um, that as heinous as his brother's action was, he did save one Lincoln. Another coincidence that seems to happen that I personally experienced is that not being aware that someone was close to death or dying, uh, that people who hadn't been around in years automatically show up. Yeah, yeah. And there's there's so many of those what we call end of life experiences where, you know, um, for example, um, my sister, my brother was been ill for a long time, had been ill for a long time. And, uh, and, you know, and, and we were, we kept constantly in touch, but my, my sister called literally at the moment, uh, he, he died, Mm. you know, um, so there are all kinds of experiences like that. One of the things that I've experienced, uh, in my capacity as an interfaith minister and working in hospice with folks, and also with family. And with family, it's a little more difficult to talk about, but uh, I seem to know uh, when someone is going to pass. Uh, With my late mother-in-law, 2018, June of 2018, was close to the end of her life. We asked the hospice nurse how long, and she said about two weeks. And I was with my wife and my my sister-in-law, and I said, I think it's going to happen tonight. I said, you guys need to spend some time with her. And she actually passed that night. So yeah. I've had that sense also. Do other people have that type of sense of? Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and, and you know, and then uh, there are all kinds of strange phenomena that, that, you know, of course, have been reported, you know, clocks stopping and dogs barking. Um, you know, I tell the story of Roy Rogers' dog who used to uh, love one of his particular uh, children. And he'd always wait um by the bus, you know, wait by the window to watch the bus come in. He knew it was like three o'clock whenever the, the bus would pull up. And one day he just started howling uh, and was, you know, could not be comforted. And they found out the daughter had died in a bus accident. Mm. Animals, animals and sensing that. That's something that you hear a lot about. Oh, yeah. Yeah, very much so. Situations where animals will crawl into bed with someone who is close to transition and just not leave the bed until they're gone. Yeah. And, or, even, and or, even stay after. Yeah, yeah. Or, in, in, you know, in some cases, maybe even do the opposite behavior. Just want to be around, but avoidant of the person. 
Yeah, yeah. So they can tell also they have that sensitivity. My guest this week is Dr. Ken Doka. He's the author of When We Die, Extraordinary Experiences at Life's End. We'll be back with more of Ken after these words on the OM Times Radio Network. Ascending Hearts is no ordinary dating site, but a spiritual dating site with a purpose to link you with your soulmate. We engineer the serendipity so you can trust that you will attune with someone that has the same matching vibration as you. Ascending Hearts, the conscious dating site for the spiritually aware. Try Ascending Hearts for free. AscendingHearts.com Hello, I'm Lisa Berry. Join me every Monday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time for Light on Living. A chance to see new, hear different, and feel more as I shine the spotlight on all the ways to lighten the load of life's challenges. Light on Living is your link to that new way you're looking for, that new understanding that will enhance your life, and that positive connection that will support your growth. So join me and you'll gain insight and start to see things in a new way that motivates you. Humanity Healing International is a small nonprofit with a big dream. Since 2007, HHI has been working tirelessly to bring help to communities with little or no hope. Our projects are not broad mandates, nor are they overnight solutions, but they bring the reassurance that no one is alone and that someone cares. To learn more, please visit HumanityHealing.org. Humanity Healing is where your heart is. Vox Novus, the new voice. Vox Novus, the new dimension. Vox Novus, thought and movement leaders who will share from their experience and offer tools to help us navigate our rapidly changing world. My name is Victor Furman. Join me every Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern on OM Times Radio for Vox Novus, the new voice. OM Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment. A philanthropic organization, their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. OM Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Learn more at She Can STEM, a message brought to you by the Ad Council. Hi, this is David Strickle. I'm excited to share my brand new show, The Stream of David Live, right here on Home Times Radio. Each week, I'll have exciting guests and I'll channel the eternal wisdom of the stream, a group of non physical entities whose teachings have transformed lives all over the world. So join us for an uplifting hour each Monday at 5 p.m. Eastern. That's the stream of David Live right here on Ohm Times Radio. So I'm a cat, and I just moved in with this new human, and she's got this little toy she's always playing with all day long. Tap, 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 bloop, bloop. She can't put it down. There it is. Oh, and get this. She even talks to it. Last week, she asked it for Chinese, and guess what? Egg rolls showed up like magic. Humans have cool toys. A person is the best thing to happen to a shelter pet. Be that person. Adopt. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the ShelterPetProject.org. Hi, this is Bill Maher. I can find humor in almost anything, but one thing I never laugh about is cruelty to animals. If you don't get the joke either, write People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, 501 Front Street, Norfolk, Virginia, 23510. Back on Destination Unlimited, my guest this week, Dr. Ken Doka. We're talking about his book, When We Die, Extraordinary Experiences at Life's End. In the book, you talk about terminal lucidity. What is that? That's another fascinating thing. Um, And and whenever I mention this to hospice, you know, hospice workers, people always talk about it. Um, It refers to somebody who is... um, 
either unconscious or has severe intellectual disabilities, uh, who all of a sudden gains lucidity right before their their death. Um, the classic case of this was um, a case that was reported um, in Germany um, of uh, of a woman. I think her name was Anna, Anna who uh, was so severely um, intellectually disabled, what we would call severe, what we used to call severely retarded, that she um, she never spoke. Uh, and all of a sudden, on the day she died, she sat up, um, uh, and she had mostly been comatose at this point in time, and sang a coherent hymn about her own dying. Mm. Um, it's so it, it had amazing impacts. It's so um, it so affected the people who um, who witnessed it, the head of the institution, the chaplain. Um, that it gave them the courage later on to oppose uh, Hitler's euthanasia program, mm. because anyone... they said, I'm sorry. "Because they said no life uh, is is unfit for life." Absolutely. D- did anyone do any neurological research on this? Um, there's some that's out now. Yes, in those days it, it wasn't, and it's it's inconclusive. But you know, and and probably one of the things is 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 often when I talk to hospice workers is you know to recognize that in some cases um you know often families look at this oh he's he's getting better he's going to you know he's going to um he's going to go into remission um and you know and and to sometimes help people to be more realistic and say maybe this is a good time just like with those nearing death experiences um to share your memories to share to validate the person's life to share your love you know, these are, are good moments to say what you have to say. Uh, my sister-in-law passed last September, and my brother, in his grieving, asked for her to give him a sign of her presence. Within seconds, a beautiful blue butterfly flew right in front of him. First of all, in his area where he lives in New Jersey, they never had blue butterflies. And he immediately knew it was a message from her. How important is the sense of presence to helping with grieving? Oh, I, I, I think... Um, you know, and again, one of my colleagues, Lou Legrand, did so much research on this, um, and he used to call these extraordinary experiences, um, which is, you know, which is about when people sort of seem to get these messages from beyond. Um, I call them post-bereavement experiences simply because they're not that extraordinary. About 60 percent of bereaved people will report this. Sometimes it's, it's like you said, that sense of presence. You just feel the person. Other times it's an actual sense experience. The first time I ever dealt with this was a was a woman who came into me. Her 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 daughter had died, and uh, from a sudden infant death syndrome at about three and a half late, but still you know within that range. And one of the little rituals she used to have with her daughter was whenever she was going out, um, she had this perfume and she'd put it on her daughter, and her daughter would make everyone uh, smell her like she smelled just not nice, just like mommy. And when she, the daughter died. Uh, she anointed her with that perfume and, and, and last thing she did before the casket was closed and put the bottle in there and switched to another um, another brand. And she came into my office and she said when I uh, she was ecstatic. She said, when I went into my daughter's room before seeing you today, I smelt the smell of that perfume all over the room. Mm. I was like 27 years old. I never heard of these kinds of experiences before. You know, um, I didn't know how to respond, but I, I think I did OK. I said, well, what did that mean to you? And she said it was my daughter's way of saying she was OK. And others will have those symbolic experiences like the butterfly um, and others will have um, kinds of experiences where they sort of dream of the person, a whole range of these these kinds of experiences. Um, you know, uh, one of my um, as I was writing this book, one of my um uh, granddaughter's friend said, oh, you should talk to my little brother. He's about 10 years old. He says, because he just had this weird dream. And and what had happened is, so um, so I met with this little 10-year-old. I said, you want to tell me about your dream? And um, he told me that he one day dreamt of his grandfather. Now, here was the interesting thing. He never, his grandfather had left his, um, had left his grandmother when uh, when his mother was a little girl. There were no pictures of him in the house. He was very rarely spoken about because essentially he had abandoned his family a long time ago and, you know, wasn't a significant part of his mother's life uh, and had died some years before this boy was born. Um, so he never saw his grandfather, never even, as I said, never even saw a picture. But he described him perfectly. 
and said his grandfather told him he has to be nice to his mother because they're going through a hard time. Mm. They were considering moving and relocating. Interesting so, that you share that. Uh, as a child, I was very close with my paternal grandfather. And when I was seven, I was sitting in my room in uh, my parents' apartment in Brooklyn, actually, and uh, I sensed that I should look up. And when I did, I saw my grandfather standing there and smiling. And I said, Grandpa, when did you come in? And he didn't say anything. He just smiled and sort of fizzled away, faded away. Oh, wow. I went into the living room where my parents were to report to them what I had seen. And they said that I was imagining this. I was labeled as a kid with an overactive imagination. <laughs> a couple of minutes later, the call came with the news of my grandfather's passing, which confirmed what my experience was about. In your research, how often do departed loved ones appear to the bereaved? Well, if, if you look at the studies of extraordinary experiences, you know, which, as I said, happen in a wide variety of ways, about 60 percent of bereaved people report they've, they've had some you know, something, whether it's a dream or, uh, or, you know, a, a sense experience or a presence or whatever, or something symbolic. But more people have it than, than literally don't. And, and what about specifically disembodied spirit or what they call ghosts? Well, um, you know, that's, that's another thing too. Um, you know, I, I don't know, I don't have any data on how many people report ghosts, but, but again, you know, you look at ghosts, they've been, um, they've been part, you know, you find them in the Bible, uh, you know, the story of, of Saul's, you know, of, uh, of Saul's, uh, conjuring up Sam, Samuel's ghost. Um, you find them throughout history, you know, they're important part of Shakespeare's play. Um, you know, in my book, I tell the story of, of my family. We have, uh, what we call the ghost. We still have our family home. Um, my, uh, my niece lives in it now. Um, and we always joke about the ghost in the basement where, um, uh, we're, we're, you know, uh, it's sort of a family story that my, um, uh, my grandmother, um, died there. Uh, she actually, uh, died by suicide there, uh, when she was, uh, you know, when my father was a young man, uh, not even a young man, a 17 year old adolescent. And, you know, when you look at these experiences and, um, they're, they're, you know, they're kind of interesting. We've always had these. I, I kind of believe that in one way it, it, it allows us to keep a bond with a woman we don't know much about. Absolutely. A lot of people in the post-transition of loved ones seek out mediums. What do you research show about that? Well, you know, um, I guess I always kind of hesitate. I'm always cautious. Um, but my notion is that certainly, um, you know, I... Certainly some people seem to have an unusual um, sense of connection. Uh, so I would say, you know, um, if I had a client coming to me and say, I want to see a medium, uh, my first question would be, what do you hope to achieve by that? And, and we'd maybe talk it through and maybe consider other ways, but I certainly wouldn't discourage somebody from doing that. On the other hand, what I do want to be sensitive to is is um, and, and uh, is the sense of exploitation that sometimes occurs. Um, but I think that's relatively rare. I think most people who claim to be mediums um, believe they are, and um, and some of them seem to be quite good at it. Absolutely, you say that we all live at the edge of forever when we die. What does that mean? Oh. I guess what I'm saying is that um, that you know, I'm going back to what um, a number of years ago, probably one of the first books ever written in the field was was Ernst Becker's Denial of Death, and and Becker makes the comment that as humans we're unique. Um, we um, we recognize, as he says, we have the bodies of worms that we, we recognize that they're, we're mortal, but there's something else that seems to say we have the mind of uh, or the souls of angels that we uh, as becker puts it that we like to think there's a life beyond this um and we seem to be compelled to believe it um in in, in however we define it however we look at it um and i think that's true i think there's something transcendental about the human spirit the human mind you know i uh, i'm a lutheran clergyman you're an interfaith clergyman i believe in an afterlife um I think now, as I look look at the, re the work that I've done, it uh, I'm I'm not sure what it's going to be like, but I I certainly believe it exists. 
Absolutely. What would you like readers to take away from when we die? I think um, I think a couple of things. I think a, a sense of appreciation of the wide range of experiences that people have. Um, a respect for those experiences when they talk with people and work with people. And then I think finally a sense of wonder. Yeah. And I think the greatest gift that we can give to each other through these experiences is something that unfortunately has been lacking in the last few years, and that's the gift of compassion. Just yeah, and hope. And hope. And, yeah, and just giving that empathy to others, giving that sense that they're not alone in the process and that there are those that love them and will continue to love them. And that they're not crazy and that um, these experiences have been shared throughout history. Absolutely. My guest, Dr. Ken Doka, is the author of the new book, When We Die, Extraordinary Experiences at Life's End. Ken, one more time, please tell our listeners where they can get your books and find out more about you and your work. Certainly. They can go to my website, www.drkendokaoneword.com. Um, and, um, you know, and, and again, um, if you're grieving, uh, both of these books may, may help you, The Journey of Grief and When We Die. Um, and, uh, and as I said, When We Die is kind of fun to read. Absolutely. And fun any, to write. Any thoughts for 2021? <laughs> um, well, it's got to be better than 2020, right? <laughs> that, that's true. Any plans that you have special stuff for 2021? Um, I'm hoping to get reengaged in life. <laughs> yeah, I think that's that's something we all would like to do, to be able yeah, to be yeah. liberated um, from the from the imposed physical separation and uh, and also maybe a little more uh, uh, like I said, a little more love and compassion for each other in the world. Oh, certainly. This has been a uh, you know, this year has been, and, and I think the pandemic has been part of it, has been a very polarized, very difficult year. You just have to turn on the television to see that. Uh, I hope we can find community again Ken, at, thank at you. all levels. Ken, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Victor. And thank you for joining us on Destination Unlimited. I'm Victor, the voice Furman. Have a wonderful week. 